SLS GmbH is not a workshop. The work shown, which we carry out on our own vehicles, are merely experience reports and may contain errors. They are therefore not to be understood as professional instructions. Unfortunately, we cannot accept orders. Honey, baby. Hi, I'm Niels from SLS, and today we're focusing on the Vario roof of the SLK R170. We've already made a video about the SLK roof. Today, however, we want to dive a bit deeper and take a closer look at the interaction of electronics, mechanics and hydraulics. To do this, we've left out the unimportant stuff, like the car itself, to give you a deeper insight into the subject. In the previous video, we showed some views, steps and main components of the roof mechanism including the emergency release. Today, we'll first look at the now fully visible Herberger hydraulic pump. The lines are non-removable parts of the cylinders, are inserted into sealing rings on the pump's aluminum block and secured with three locking rotary tabs. The matching of the number pairs on the locking tabs and the lines must, of course, be correct. The respective cylinder sides to be controlled are supplied with up to 200 bar of oil pressure, resulting in the movement sequence and a reverse movement when the opposite cylinder sides are controlled. The return flow into the unpressurized tank occurs via ball pressure valves in the block near the pump. In the hydraulic system, there are no gas or spring pressure accumulators, so if the pump stops, either a temporary halt or a give-in against gravity occurs, and the system fully relaxes through valve opening after no more than seven minutes. Although the metal roof could be considered an upgrade compared to older SL models, it is extremely rational in the R170. The pump operates the ten lines to the five cylinders with only two solenoid valves. All mechanical follow-up movements are guided by cables and levers. The pump has an oil reservoir with a filter screen and fill level markings. Approved oils are so-called ZHM oils according to Operating Fluid Specification 343.0. In this video, we will not cover cylinder repairs, electronic details, or diagnosing deterioration of the pump. For such issues, we strongly recommend visiting a specialized workshop. Their expertise not only saves time, but also prevents costly damage from failed attempts. In addition to the STAR diagnosis system, specialized workshops have a test valve block. This allows for the separate control of specific pressure lines and the measurement of flow rate and pressure. We recommend using a support to secure the partially open roof. Now let's discuss the interaction between hydraulics, mechanics and electronics. In the previous video, we started the roof opening with a view of the trunk interior. This allows us to directly focus on the movements in the front roof section. Hereafter, we'll refer to the hydraulic cylinders at the C-pillar main hinge, next to the parcel shelf as the main cylinders. The rearmost cylinders in the trunk are the trunk lid cylinders, and the cylinder in the upper roof section is the cross cylinder. Without the headliner, here is the interaction of the front cross cylinder with the push rods to the rotary latches, the pull cables to the C-pillar locks, and the end position micro switches. Our degree scale helps us during the tests. If the lever points in the driving direction or at 90 degrees, the rotary latches are locked, the roof is closed, and the end position switches are activated. The cross cylinder is retracted and the cables for the C-pillar locks are relaxed. Our lever pointer rotates to its crosswise position, turning 180 degrees on the scale when the cross cylinder extends approximately 32 millimeters to open the roof. The rotary latches handle the unlocking and extending of the front hooks, the opening of both end position switches, and the tensioning of the cables to release the C-pillar locks. As long as this hydraulic extension pressure is applied to the cylinder, this happens against the small tension springs at the C-pillar locks. When the pressure is released, our pointer rotates back by approximately 10 to 15 degrees. 
This corresponds to the movement of the front pins and rotary latches when viewed from the front. In addition to the longitudinal movement of the hooks, their guide's cam shape allows for the necessary lateral movement. This ensures a proper fit into the lock catches of the windshield frame. The plastic-coated pin aids in the initial contact and insertion of the roof into the windshield frame. On the right side, it also activates a micro switch in the windshield frame. The lock catches can be adjusted laterally in their position. Adjustability through elongated holes or shims is also present in most other joints and locks as well as in the cable housings. Professionals have a clear advantage here because following the correct sequence during adjustments prevents inadvertent worsening. After the front cross cylinder has set everything in motion for the roof opening and the rear cylinders have received pressure, we look at the end position switches. In the covered area behind the C-pillar, next to the blue connector for the rear window heater, there is a yellow connector with wires from the front roof that can be easily tapped into. The end position switches in the roof close in series after the front locks have successfully engaged, which can be demonstrated. This principle applies as an example to the other switches involved. A ground circuit is completed, signaling the fulfilled conditions for subsequent control unit operations. Here again is the mentioned roof frame switch. It exists only on the right side. Similarly, only on the right side, there is a switch at the C-pillar joint that detects the folded roof. Counted them? So far, that's four micro-switches. The switch on the luggage roller blind on the right side has often asserted itself as important. No comment on that. Rarely noticeable and not exposed by us today is the rotary switch on the trunk lid lock. The next three switches become clear after removing the side panels in the trunk. I'll get a broom. I'll belt up. Now here comes the plug connector. Again, only on the right side in the fender corner, a pivot switch is visible, which acknowledges the fully raised position of the trunk lid and the front lock catches of the trunk lid. Tubular frame have one on each side, left and right. We simulate a few errors by bridging or omitting them. An example consequence is that when closing the trunk hydraulically without success feedback, there will be no pump shutdown and no control to raise the rear windows. You can tell he won't stop pumping because he keeps trying to forcefully close the rear locks. Upon restart, we should receive an error message now. Therefore, the next point will be the pump wiring. Rare but not entirely impossible is the failure of the pump control relay. By simply bridging this socket, we can gain insights into the power supply and the readiness of the pump. It also helps us to pump oil out of the reservoir. Power supply is red-green on socket 2, pump positive on 8. Ground for the relay coil on 4. And here on socket 6, the control positive for the relay coil would come in with the wire color pink-red. Further along the pump cable, you'll find this 8-pin connector. In addition to the wires mentioned earlier, there's yellow for valve positive Y1, green-brown for valve positive Y2. There are also two violet wires for valve grounds from the pump temperature sensor and the pump ground, which is white here. This other 8-pin connector serves as the junction point for the trunk lid. 
Alongside the roof-relevant lock switch, it also houses lighting and central locking controls. The power supply for the pump unit in our 1999 model comes from fuse number 25 with 40 amps in the fuse box located to the left near the brake booster. The fuse box on the right manages higher level main supplies. Now that we have a clearer picture of the end position switches, pump control and power supply, let's move on to the control unit in the module box. We disconnect the battery regardless of stored codes. Down here is a hook to lift, and if there's one in the rear too, we'll likely get the whole assembly in our hands. As far as possible. And then, and then. This is the main power supply. With this, you can also pull the remaining connectors. Here's the top view of the long vehicle side connector. With glasses, the numbers corresponding to the contacts become visible. Our end position switch states arrive here as input potential and can be accessed or simulated based on the profile. Just by the number of poles, it's evident that the comfort control unit integrates even more functions such as turn signal and window lifter controls. Alongside other devices, there's also signal exchange, for instance, related to vehicle speed. Its memory is also queried during error diagnostics. We attempted unsuccessfully to diagnose through the 38-pin socket. Occasionally, we hear about issues, such as those traditionally caused by cracked solder joints, which are addressed in the well-organized repair industry. But back to the pump. To satisfy our amateur curiosity, we also opened a spare pump. From the motor side, the square part is actually the valve block up here, with the line addresses. The annular pump element is removed here, allowing a view of the stationary central hollow pin. It has a suction and a pressure channel. Here's the view from the reservoir side. We've attached the rotating pump element to the electric motor for demonstration. The pin-shaped, radially inserted piston is one of three. Eccentrically positioned, it is surrounded by a rotor ring showing noticeable wear marks from piston contact on the inner side. Here's a clear explanation. The eccentric arrangement causes the three pistons, when the pump element rotates, to draw inwards from the center during suction and to push outwards into the other bolt channel during discharge. The running and pumping direction of the pump in this system is always the same, just like the use of full onboard voltage. In principle, it's quite universal and robust, but like all hydraulic systems, it's sensitive to dirt, dry running and heat from overuse. Here's the left side block assembly. The brass-colored relief valve has a critical maximum torque of only 3 newton meters and should never be used under hydraulic load. To prevent it from being unscrewed too far, there's a neighboring screw with a wide cap. Below it is one of the spring-loaded ball valves. On the right side, it looks similar, and on the reservoir side, the sieve filter can still be removed and inspected. Going deeper into the motor or valve block requires the expertise of a specialized workshop. Upon closer inspection, the sealing in the line sockets and the channels in the solenoid valves are visible. Here, O-rings remain on the valves. Although the two identical valves have only one activation direction, they serve multiple functions, transmitting pressure, thus activating both the valve and pump, maintaining pressure, thus activating the valve, but deactivating the pump, and allowing backflow, thus deactivating the valve. The valve's operation can be observed and heard to some extent. Our conclusion, in the current situation, replacing a faulty pump with a better quality, used one is advisable, and regular system maintenance, such as an oil change, is beneficial. Both our carless roof 
and the hydraulic system in their green sheet metal outfit reveal concerning amounts of dirt in the oil reservoir. Above the fill level and overall, there isn't a good opening that allows draining via syringe or gravity. A fine metric M8 by one fitting with a hose and the help of the electric pump is useful here. Only as much as necessary for the reservoir removal. A few minutes ago, we talked about relay bridging for this purpose. Is the reservoir clamp accessible when the pump is installed in the car? We'll make it easy on ourselves and continue working on the freestanding pump. Carefully lever the reservoir off over the O-ring, marvel at the oil sludge, and start the cleaning process together. Thank you for sacrificing your finger. <laughs> However, there are also no, solid particles in here. Where could that have come from? That is really quite bad. <laughs> but it's so fine. Really looks like an O-ring. I think so too. And where is the rest of it? The emergency valve screw has two quite small O-rings and the warnings about mishandling them are well known. During reassembly, after cleaning, it becomes clear that the same work on the installed car will be more difficult, especially when carefully repositioning the reservoir. The fill screw on top is M10, which is suitable for a small hose or funnel. Oil brands with MB approval 343.0 for ZHM applications are readily available, and the small R170 roof hydraulics requires 420 milliliters, about half of which doesn't appear at the oil change interval. This video has already shown the small size of the pump pistons. With a delivery volume of 0.3 liters per minute, circulation and bleeding are still quickly taken care of. Yep. So, and officially, this is the position where the oil level should be measured. Looks somehow unhealthy. Regarding the markings, an oil level between min and max is always okay. With cold oil and in the shown trunk position, being close to the min mark is not a concern. It also makes sense to observe the color of the fresh oil. Additionally, a warning. Whenever there's a risk of air entering individual cylinders due to work on the SLK roof, extra caution is advised afterward. From unfavorable positions, the roof and trunk lid can drop into end positions or problems can arise from a forgotten hydraulic opening. Currently, there are increasing options, guides and parts assortments available to help with hydraulic leaks. However, our recommendation remains to visit a specialist workshop. At reputable places, issues like performance decline, internal leakage and cylinder compression can be addressed much more effectively. Damage to the roof lining due to leaks in hydraulic cylinders or weather sealing is unfortunately quite common. Out of curiosity, we are experimentally holding up a new replacement part that can be individually disguised. Interestingly, in the MB workshop information system, maintenance instructions for the Vario roof profile seals frequently highlight special care oil. The alignment of the roof in terms of shape and gap dimensions and the aging condition of the rubber ceiling frames are gaining additional relevance now, 27 years after the R170 series started. This allows enthusiasts to appreciate well-preserved original parts in the still active used parts market. After today's inspection of the mechanics, several friction points became apparent. Our motto, don't hesitate to remove the covers. It surely contributes to the reliability and lifespan of the roof, so that's it once again. I hope our contribution could provide some assistance with diagnosing potential issues with the Vario roof. If you have any doubts, it's better to go to a specialist workshop and have it checked, and if necessary, repaired. This isn't necessarily for everyone, but we've been able to shed some light on how this whole system works. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next video. Until then.